So just a second ago, I discovered a really good example of why it's important to have clean code. Now, what I will say is you shouldn't focus 100% on making sure your code's perfect, uh, but it's something that can help you in times when you're fixing bugs or just, you know, when adding features in general. So I have here uh, my game loaded up here. And you can see here the walls, well, nothing looks out of place, obviously. Um, and I actually had this bug that I'm about to show you for quite a while, and I didn't really look into it. But now that I've looked into it, I've discovered, wow, okay, uh, how, why is it? Why is this bug happening? What's causing it? And how can I fix it? So let me show you what the bug is, because you don't see it. So in this area, we have uh, stone. But over here, you can see we have these kind of crystal walls, if you will. And oh, what's over here? Oh, this is a uh, it was a sandstone, but you don't see it here. Uh, but here you do see it. Where, I mean, it's very faint. Let me zoom in. Maybe there's like a little crack there, right? And walls don't normally have cracks when they haven't been touched by a pickaxe, I suppose. So I'm going to go into the scene view here, and uh, we're going to zoom in on this area, and I'm going to click on the block here and you'll see here I've made so this is the sprite renderer here's the box collider here's the object so I made this little thing it helps it's really nifty for testing and you know it works out really well so I can basically change uh, the crack of each individual block or at least not the actual crack but just the the sprite that's rendered on top to visualize the crack so here I just got to, all I have to do is change this slider and you can see it changes the crack amount and this would be for like if you're going to be hitting it with a pickaxe or something. And you can see here that when it's at negative one, it's actually, uh, there's no crack at all. But when it's z z uh, zero, it's going, you're going to see the first frame and then the second, third, fourth, so on and so forth. So basically this slider is just for controlling, you know, which frame to show or not any frame at all. So by default, it shows a negative one, like the actual object itself. If we look at my prefabs here, this is the prefab for the object, you'll see it defaults to 31. And even in the code, it's like that. So what's interesting, let me rerun the game here. It's probably going to take a second. Bear with me. I don't know why I honestly, OK, there we go. I don't know why I unpaused the game. I want to make this quick. So we go, OK, here we go, perfect. So here's another block. And it's kind of weird because some of them have the crack, but this one doesn't. And if we look, you'll see that, uh, go back to the block, it has a zero. So zero means the first frame. It's like the first index in an array is zero. So it's the first sprite frame. But negative one just means don't show anything, basically. That's just the way I did it. Um, so by default, it's supposed to show negative one, meaning don't show anything. And once you damage the block, it becomes zero. All right. And I'm going to show you how that actually happens. Like if I, well, let me do this. So let me turn on, because I had this turned off actually. But if I, you can see here, if I mouse over the block, I can click on it and it cracks it. So this is just for testing. But you can see here, I can actually manipulate these. And if I click on this block here, you'll see that we have, here it's frame six in particular. So I'm damaging the block. There's some damage information somewhere. And uh, that there's a system that basically tells these blocks, hey, you need to update your crack sprite so that you're displaying the health properly. OK, so let's look at my actual code. And this is really where I'm going to get into, you know, why it's important to uh, practice good, clean code. And it's I, honestly, this is more of just an, a specific example of why you should do this certain thing and not other things or whatever. So you can see here, this is the code for uh, that kind of is behind this block object script on each individual block. And here is the actual variable. Now you'll see here it is private. I know I didn't include the word private, but the default access modifier in C sharp is private. So if you leave it empty, it's private. Although there is a minute difference. This is leaving it blank is not the same as there's a there's a slight dis difference I'll, I'll tell you that much but i forget what it is um also you can actually obviously you can access it through the inspector here because i have it serialized but beyond that there is no way to access 
this variable outside of this code because of the fact that it is private. So one thing you can do because of that, because you know, okay, so this block, well, not this one in particular, but like this one, I didn't mind this one, but it's displaying a crack. So that's not right, okay? That's, it shouldn't be displaying that. It should be negative one because that's what it started off with, but it's zero. Why is it zero? And so the reason why it's zero, if we look back at the code, or one way we can kind of realize, you know, what's causing it to be zero is, well, first of all, uh, what's causing it to, to change, okay? So the only thing that can cause this variable to change is stuff within the class. So it's going to be a lot easier to, to, to track the issue. So if I right click on this variable, you might not have known this, but if you double click to kind of select the variable, right click on, in fact, you could probably, yeah, you could just right click on it, I think, and then click find all references. And this is just my setup here, but yours might look different. But uh, hopefully you'll have some pop up and it'll show you all of the different places where the variable, that variable is actually used. So I can see there's only two places in my code. So the one place is right here where it's in this on validate which should only occur when uh in editor mode so when you're playing the game okay so when you're in the editor but you're playing it'll work because you just saw you saw it working this basically is used whenever you you know this slider whenever you change this slider the what's actually happening is that uh on validate is being called and so this code executes every single time uh, you change that slider. And it's something that only happens in edit mode. Um, but so there's probably some other place. I mean, it could happen in uh, runtime. It could happen like when you build your program as well. I'm not sure if probably not. But regardless, I want to fix this issue, at least in the editor, because it doesn't look like it should be happening. So. Uh, so we have the crack frame here. This is us just setting the actual uh, integer. Well, it's a float here, but it's just, it's basically an integer, and that's used in the shader to tell it, you know, which frame of the the uh, sprite to use, because it's one whole texture. So it needs, you need to get the correct uh, sub image, if you will. So the other place where it's used is in this one function that is public. Okay, it is public. So that means you can call this function from other places. But one of the places where it's actually called internally is another function I have here called set crack based on damage. So I can set the crack index arbitrarily, just whatever I want. And that is, of course, used here. But I can also set the crack based on damage. So this function, now I believe this one I'm actually not using anywhere. I am using it inside. Oh, I'm actually using it in the level. Oh, and that's why too. Uh, so really, I'm only using this function publicly for the purpose of uh, setting it to negative one, which makes it hidden. But anyway, so if we have, uh, okay, I'm getting lost. So this is the function that's being called. And basically, whenever you damage a block, this function is going to be called to update the sprites to effectively just update the actual crack frame sprite that should be used to render on the block. And so here, this is actually where the issue was being caused. I actually discovered what was going wrong and I double checked before I made this video. And yes, and so it was a very, very, very simple fix. And I'm not going to say that was because I used good coding practices, but I could say that it at least helped to some degree. Because if this variable was public, then I could be accessing, could be, if I did that, I could be accessing this variable or someone else could be accessing this variable from a different location, completely separate from the block object. And if there's an issue related to it, it becomes extremely difficult to track down. And so what's important is making sure that, you know, there are some cases where this does uh where you can kind of mend this, you can kind of twist this rule of thumb. But most of the time, 99% of the time, you want to make sure all of your variables are private. Okay. I mean, I should, I honestly should put private there because having that and just having nothing 
are slightly different, but they're both the same in that you can't access it publicly from other uh, places in your code. But for the most part, we're fine here. So the crack frame point is you can't access it from anywhere except in here. So if there's a bug and it's related to this variable, you know the bug is in this file and it makes it easier to figure out what's going wrong. And if you know, like here I could show you that I can change this slider and I can demonstrate that it's working as intended. So this isn't the issue. It's The issue isn't that, you know, the slider isn't displaying the correct sprite. It's just that whatever is manipulating this slider, whatever is manipulating in effect the crack frame, it's doing it wrong. So this function is the root cause. And the reason why is because when the game first starts up, the amount of damage that a uh, a block starts off with is zero. So instead of health, it's damage, which I feel like I should have I shouldn't have did it that way. Or I for, actually I forget which way I did it. I don't know if I did it like ascending or descending, where it's like you start off with this much health, and then over time. No, no, no. I, yeah, I did it like that, where you start off, instead of health, instead of health, it's damage. So basically, you start off with total damage of zero, and then as you hit the block more, the damage increases until it exceeds a certain number, and then it's, you know, the block has been broken. Okay, so, and then every time we change that damage amount, we call this function to update the sprite. Now, one of the interesting things, which you may or may not know, is that sometimes floating points have a really hard time at checking to see if something is zero. And this is actually the first time I've ever had that situation happen to me where it is like, like okay, something is totally going wrong here. Like you can tell something's going wrong. So in the beginning, all the blocks should have a damage of zero, okay? Uh, and so what happens is that the in fact, if the if the damage of the block is zero, then you shouldn't be displaying any cracks, okay, in the block. So what the code's doing here is, and I called it crack index, although I could have called it you know something else probably. Uh, but this is the damage of the block at that point in time, and what we're doing is we're dividing it by the block's hardness. So different blocks can have different hardnesses. And this is basically a, um, the data, this is ugly. <laughs> this, this code looks ugly, but it works. So this is basically just showing, uh, or this contains any information for blocks, you know, such as the texture and the hardness. And the hardness, you know, the health, that's basically like the health of the block. So harder block takes more hits to break it unless the pickaxe is also stronger within itself. So we take the damage, which could be zero, divided by the hardness, which is usually some number. Now, obviously, if the hardness is zero, we're going to get a different error. Either it's going to give me an exception saying you're dividing by zero, or the answer will be nan, not a number, n-a-n, um, if you were wondering what nan meant, if you ever had that kind of message pop up. But uh, one of those two things will happen, and that will be the issue. But here it's not. Um, and I could also make it so that it's impossible to make the hardness zero with like an inspector validator thing as well, which I think I do have. I don't know. Um, I could check, but I'm too lazy. So here we have, uh, I'm about to, well, I have my calculator in real life, but I got this calculator. So zero obviously divided by, you know, let's say the hardness of a given block is like 10. So zero divided by 10 is obviously zero. And then you say total crack frames. What's that? So total crack frames is I put it as 10 because if we change the, the uh, if we want to add more frames, you know, it, make it, you know, a more detailed animation, then we could change this number. This is not the most perfect and beautiful way of doing it, but that's just the way I did it for that particular, for the moment. Uh, so let's see here. Total crack frames, which is 10. So zero times 10 is still zero. I don't have to punch this into a calculator. So it seems like that should be fine. You know, if we do the math in our heads, you go, okay, yeah, so if the damage is zero, you divide it by a number and multiply it by a number, it's still zero. And so when you say if crack index is equal to zero, and you call this function, 
what this is telling it to do is to basically not display any crack whatsoever, not even the first frame. It's negative one. That's what negative one means. But it's not. So for whatever reason, this crack index, which is a float, is giving a number that is really close to zero, but it isn't zero. And I don't know why. There's a good chance that probably what's happening is that the damage float is not actually zero, but it's actually really close to zero. So it could be zero. It could be like 0 0.00001, really close to zero. And if you zoom out, it might look like zero, but it isn't. Hold on. Okay. And then we divide it by 10 for the hardness, and then we multiply it by 10 for the total uh, crack frames. And you're going to get this. I mean, obviously, I just divided and multiplied by the same numbers. It didn't matter, but I could have divided by 30. And we get this really small number. It's close to zero. And so when you're checking for, and this is one of the things you have to keep in mind when working with floating point numbers, is that when you try to check to see if a float is equal to a, another number, it might not, the two values aren't always going to be exact. And you know this because numbers can have infinite precision. You know, you can have zero point and then follow it with as many numbers as you want unless you accidentally press the num the num keys incorrectly, and then you don't get a number at all. So uh, in this case, it's a number that's just not close enough to zero for it not to count, because that's actually how it checks for equality. It actually checks and sees, is it close enough? And so you can see here, you might be wondering, what the frick is epsilon? And that's kind of involved in, in that process. When you're checking to see if two floating point numbers are equal, the epsilon constant is what's used it's just a really small number you can see there it's 1.4 whatever e to the negative 45th power really small number and that's basically just a number that's used to say okay if this if these two values are really close to each other they might as well be the same value you know you might as well because they're not going to get any closer because we're working with a limited number of bits essentially and this is for 32 bits but it was 64 bits so i made the amateur mistake of accidentally hitting the stop recording button so that last clip just got cut off really abruptly i'm sorry about that uh, but really all i was talking about at the very end there was that really all i need to do to fix that issue and now i can actually show it because in the last clip i actually forgot to show that it was fixed uh, but here I can show it. So all it is, is basically I am flooring this entire value, which could be very, very close to zero, but not close enough for this to check out for this function to be called rather than this one. And so I'm going to add this function in to floor the value. And it's also going to convert it to an int, meaning that I can turn this into an integer. And I can also remove this little cast right here because it's an integer. And that's really all pretty much all I had to do, really do here. And so now I can show, got to let it compile, run the game, and we can see. Now, some of the blocks it didn't actually show the cracks, probably because of the fact that the hardness values were different. And so for values that had a higher hardness, that division of zero and a really large number could have been causing uh, the number to be far enough away from zero so that it wouldn't actually be equal to zero. So that's most likely what caused that issue. Um, but you can see here, perfect. So you can see here, uh, there's no more cracks. Uh, there's the crystal, no cracks, nothing. So that's what it was. It was just that the floating point value was, you know, like if you do say, for example, like, let's say the health was like 0 0.001. Okay, it should be zero, but for whatever reason, it's like that. And so if we divide it by, let's say, 30, then you get that. And then if you multiply it by 10, you get that or something. So it could, I don't know what the cause was, but that's the most logical way to fix the issue is to just literally say, okay, this should be an integer, so you might as well do the conversion anyway. So yeah, um, and the last thing I said in the original recording of me that was not actually recording at that moment was me 
uh, kind of sponsoring myself and saying, hey, uh, check out this game. I did not actually, if, if you're, if you've never seen this before, if this game looks interesting to you, if you like games with procedural generation and uh, caves and mining and all that cool stuff, uh, I'm going to have links in the description that allow you to figure out what this is all about. We have a Discord, we have a website, we have a Twitter, we have a Patreon, we have a Steam store page for this game. And so you can go check it out and see what this awesome, interesting mining game is all about. We got biomes, we got, what else do we got? Um, I don't know. I mean, that's, we got crystals, we got green energy crystals, if anyone knows that reference. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we have mushrooms that are the size of a human being. We have stalag mites. We have uh, coral or something that looks like coral. Uh, but yeah, and we have awesome caves and we're going to have mining and ores and all that good stuff. So yeah, if you want, if, if this game looks interesting to you, go check us out to go join our discord and say hi. Someone, someone will be there to say hi. I promise you. We, that's just what we do. So anyway, thank you guys for watching um, and love programming.